There's people still putting out YouTube content who used to live four blocks from me. Four blocks from me. There's a person that you may have heard of. He he's from Pensacola, Florida, which is where I'm from. Yeah, from uh, Pensacola. <laughs> and he he owned a dinosaur park. He owned a yeah, dinosaur I park. Think, I think I might have heard of this guy once or twice that you're talking about. Yes. I think you might have heard of me once or twice too. Are we gonna see any more? of that he's out there he's saying crazy shit to the internet every day i'm not gonna do his new youtube stuff because he's just saying the same shit he said you know 20 years ago so i don't know uh, i'll give you a pass on some of that <laughs> I i'm gonna finish the speech that i started because that's his like his magnum opus that's his big fucking you know this is all i got both barrels 100 reasons evolution is so stupid that's what i'm gonna finish good Good. I'm glad I'm okay. you're going to finish it. Like, please no, don't leave, I... leave him, man. And some moron have been putting out videotapes. Who, who is? They said, Ken, you've got to watch this guy who's making videotapes about you. Um, what's it called? Yeah. Who? Who? Some guy wears a black mask and a black hat and talks about me and plays little clips of my seminar and... Uh... <laughs> that, that sounds like... Logic. Uh, huh? Logic. Logicked. L O G I C K E D. But that's. Uh, I think it's me. What a coward. No, 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 no. I'm not a coward. Come on down and visit. <laughs> no, no, I can't. It's been too long. Nobody cares anymore. Nobody cares. Coward. Nobody calls me coward. Now, come on, grow up. But I already did. Or am I still just a little baby? What a moron. Okay. Oh! Oh! It was all a dream. Oh. That's all in the past now. He's in the past. I'll stop having these nightmares eventually. Right? Logic. Eh? I'm sorry, Logic, but I must speak with you very urgent. Get out of here! I just woke up from a- The time has come, Logic. You must finish what you started. What are you talking about this time? The time has come for you to make another videotape about Kent Hovind. Was I talking in my sleep? Yes, Logic, but this is not because of your dream. All of the dinosaur fossils on Earth have just come into alignment with the planet Nibiru. And our world will come to an end unless you finish your Kent Hovind debunk series. Bullshit. It is not bullshit, Logic. When have I ever bullshitted you? Every time you've ever talked to me, it's bullshit. Okay, yes, it is bullshit logic, but people have been asking for it. Your angel, Nemamaya, told me so. That's bullshit too. There's no fucking way anyone's still asking for that. It's been over a year since I made one of those. And that speech I was debunking was already super old when I started. Nobody cares anymore. It is true logic. I have seen it written in the stars. And Twitter. I see. Then perhaps it truly is time. Of course it is logic. What? Oh, uh. Of course it is, logic Very well, let us begin. Okay, whoever does my editing, roll the intro, the classic one. Let's get this shit show back on the road. But my material's not copyrighted, you can use mine any way you want. This one's for you, Kent. Do you want to get any of my video materials? They're not copyrighted. Check it out. You're a button. Then they're gonna tell the kids, we've got evidence for evolution because dinosaurs turned to birds. Wow, it is so weird to hear your voice again, now that you've faded into even more complete irrelevancy. But right, so you say dinosaurs turning into birds is presented as evidence of evolution. And right off the bat, you're fucking wrong. Dinosaurs turning into birds is evolution, so that's the claim, not the evidence. The claim can't be evidence for the claim. And by the way, that also means the Bible can't be evidence for the Bible. Just so you know. No, the evidence for evolution is not that dinosaurs evolved into birds. It's the evidence that supports the idea that dinosaurs evolved into birds. The hint is in what I just said. The evidence. This is stupid. This guy says dinosaurs are alive as birds. Well, kids, in case you don't know, there are a few differences between a dinosaur and a bird. 
Yes, a very few in some cases. For example, have a look at these pictures that I took personally, just for you. And you explain to me, anatomically speaking, which hard line divides the dinosaur fossils from the bird fossils here. You have fun, and whatever you do, definitely don't type dinosaur bird fossil into Google Images. I don't think you'd like what you find very much. Oh, but, um, right, they're probably all, uh, hoaxes? Yeah, gotta be hoaxes. Only the fossils Dr. Dino approves of are real, right? You don't just put a few feathers on them and say, come on, man, give it a try. <laughs> it won't hurt too bad. <sighs> hey, Ezet. Yeah? How do I do this again? Can I just call him a fucking moron and move on, or do I really seriously need to explain this? Explain it. You're the guy who actually takes this kind of nonsense seriously. Well, okay, but who am I doing that for? I mean, all the smart people already see the problem. The creationists are never gonna. So what does it matter? It doesn't matter! You know you can't just move on without addressing the point. Of course I can! I can do whatever I want <sighs> Fuck. I just can't bring myself to do it. You're right. You said it like it's unusual! Look, there's no need to rub it in, okay? Okay, Kent. You're holding a toy sauropod, and you just showed a stupid picture of people trying to push a sauropod off a cliff. But you and I both know full well that nobody's proposing that birds evolve from fucking sauropods! Do those fossils I just showed you look anything like a goddamn Brachiosaurus? I picked a great place to stop in the last video because it meant I got to start out with not only one of the most ridiculous claims in your entire speech, but also one of the most obviously dishonest. I mean, this is clearly not a case of you being dumb or deluded. This is you being deliberately deceptive. You've carefully and purposely chosen the least bird-like dinosaur you can think of so your ignorant audience will find it more ridiculous. You know, when I heard your audience laugh at your joke, I was genuinely shocked. I mean, I know that during this series they've laughed at some dumb fucking statements, but apparently you managed to find such a stupid audience that a good chunk of them apparently think all dinosaurs were giant four-legged beasts. Unbelievable. That's stupid, okay? Oh, it sure is. If they're that stupid, I'm amazed they can even spell their own names. But then again, I have no evidence that they can. Dinosaurs did not turn to birds, okay? Sauropods. You're, you're talking about sauropods. And you damn well know it. Which is why, Lil Kenty, when you went to the toy store to pick the perfect dinosaur toy for show and tell, you took that one instead of a velociraptor or a microraptor or any other small bipedal feathered theropod! The fact that you considered this deception necessary in order to make your point, even to that audience, comes off as an implicit confession that the similarities between certain kinds of dinosaurs and birds are a little bit too clear for your comfort. Somewhere along the line, while his front legs are developing into wings, they're going to be half leg, half wing, which means he can't run and he can't fly yet. So even after you already made your dumb joke, you're not even going to stop pretending this is a conversation about sauropods? You're just gonna keep running with it, huh? Well, I mean, you're perfectly safe assuming your audience isn't gonna pick up on it, but that's not quite the case with mine. Bird-like theropods are bipedal. They don't run on their front legs, so this argument makes no damn sense at all. Oh, and by the way, half leg, half wing just means a leg with feathers on it, which is exactly what you see on those fossils I just showed you, and on plenty more. So basically a wing with a clawed hand sticking out. You know, something like this juvenile what's seen. Except, of course, that the clawed hands would have kept sticking out of the wing into adulthood instead of developing into the typical blunt, clubby bird hands of the adult what's seen. Kent, if a wing with fingers sticking out is not half leg and half wing, then I don't know what is. He's gonna have a hard time, isn't he? Not particularly, no. Even the less bird-like feathered theropods would have been able to easily use their feathered forelegs for short glides or to help themselves up steep inclines by flapping. That's actually quite a significant survival advantage both for hunting and for escaping. And there's no reason the feathers would have inhibited their hunting, especially if they mostly killed with their back legs and teeth. But hey, it's true! If you glue a bunch of feathers on a Diplodocus, it'll have some trouble flying. I guess I gotta give you that one! No, dinosaurs did not turn into birds. That is stupid, okay? Oh, so you do know there are more kinds of dinosaurs than just sauropods. And so maybe you do know there are dinosaurs whose forelimbs could resemble wings without impacting their ability to run. Well, who could have guessed you were lying? Okay, let's take a look at what you got here. So it's a hideous, disproportionate cartoon that I'm pretty sure isn't supposed to resemble any particular dinosaur. Whatever, not important, we don't expect precision from you. But I find it strange that you've portrayed it as totally featherless, despite the fact that what we're talking about is feathered theropods evolving into feathered birds. But the most interesting part of this thing by far is the wings. Look carefully. This animal has three digits exposed on the front of the wing, with the fourth digit elongated into a support structure for a featherless wing membrane which is attached to the entire arm. Birds don't have any of that, nor does any feathered dinosaur. But do you know what does? A pterosaur. 
Yeah. Kent, apparently you've never seen a featherless bird. You've never had a Thanksgiving dinner. And you honestly think this is how their wings are because for some reason, apparently you think birds are the same thing as pterosaurs. That is truly incredible. Wait a second. Is that why chemist, scientist, auto technician John Morris Pendleton thought he could catch a pterosaur? He thinks a pterosaur is just a bird? Now, the idea is to get a tranquilizer gun and uh, tranquilize it, mount a radio transmitter. But the thing is, we want it to go and tell us where the family is. I, I'm kind of greedy. I don't want one pterodactyl. I want the whole family. They say we've got proof that they did Archaeopteryx which means ancient wing. Now, Archaeopteryx was proven to be a fraud in 1986. So this author is 13 years behind the time. Aha. Uh -huh. And Christianity was proven to be a fraud in 1985. Hey, if you're gonna play that game, so am I. Google for it, bitch. Oh, come on. Debunk it properly. Why should I? He spat out one line, no citations, didn't even spend a few seconds to say how it was proven or by whom. He doesn't care enough about his own claim to take it seriously, so why should I? You're supposed to be the guy who tries to figure out what their argument is even when they don't bother to make one. People like it when you're thorough. Oh, fine. Oh, and by the way, Kent, your speech was in 2001, so 1986 was 15 years ago, not 13. Can't even get basic math right. Okay, so I think I know what you're referring to, but it's from 1985, not 1986, like you said. But it continues in 88, so 86 is in between. So, have you ever heard of the very reputable scientific journal, the British Journal of Photography? You know, photography. It's a science, in the same way that auto-technicianism is a science. I've also learned automotive technician, uh, that's applied science, plus I'm also a mid-husband six times. I only have one client, <laughs> my wife. <laughs> okay, marvelous. So that's applied marvelous. science also. Yes, it is. So what do you think happens when two astronomers, a physicist, a medical doctor, and a photographer become convinced of a paleontological hoax by looking at low-quality pictures taken with a handheld camera in 1984? Well, exactly what you would expect. The claims are checked against reality, immediately debunked, and subsequently forgotten by everyone, except the desperate creationists who need to believe anything that could possibly be thought to agree with them, and who don't care one bit if it was already soundly refuted and irrelevant before I was even born. So basically what happened is that the astronomer Fred Hoyle and the creationist physicist Lee Spetner and others published some articles in the British Journal of Photography claiming that the Berlin specimen and the London specimen of Archaeopteryx were fake. They had evidence, yeah. It was some shitty pictures they took on their own, without even bothering to consult the very high-quality museum photos that would have immediately laid to rest some of their arguments. The motive that they thought drove the hoax was that Richard Owen wanted to support Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection, and so he had the specimens faked. Which is a little bit odd, considering that he disagreed with Darwin's theory. The other possible motive was that Richard Owen wanted to prank Darwin by making this totally fake thing called the Archaeopteryx, and making a big deal about it, and getting Darwin on board believing it, and then pulling the rug out from under him and saying, ha ha, it was never real in the first place. You look so stupid, you should have seen the look on your face. Because nowadays he would have been doing pranks on YouTube. Of course, that's also a little bit weird because, well, for one thing, it's utterly fucking juvenile and pointless, and there's no reason whatsoever to think that he would actually do something like that. But also, Owen had seriously written about Archaeopteryx before. If it came out as a fake, he would look just as dumb. I don't know, the reasoning here is asinine, it goes beyond the most idiotic conspiracy theories I know of. Anyway, the authors claimed that the specimens were created by finding a small reptile skeleton, fossilized, putting artificial cement around it, and pressing chicken feathers into it. Now, if you think carefully for a second, you're probably gonna think of a couple of problems with that. Number one, wouldn't it be pretty fucking obvious if there's artificial cement all over the top of the slab? There's gonna be a discontinuity between the cement and the limestone. You're gonna be able to tell where the distinction is. And that's not there, obviously. And number two, where is someone gonna find something that good to use as artificial cement in the mid-19th century? I mean, the whole thing is farcical on its face. Just what I've said so far is enough to demonstrate that it's complete bullshit, which is not even to mention that there are hairline cracks which are naturally infill with mineral material, crossing between the wing parts and the bones, there are dendrites on the specimens, crystallization over top of it which would make it impossible to forge, especially when you consider that the cracks and the dendrites match in microscopic detail on both the slab and the counter slab, and the fact that this ignores every other Archaeopteryx specimen that was known at that time, at least two of which had obvious feather impressions as well, which in 
the case of the Maxburg specimen, even went under the bones and were covered with dendrites, which again, makes it impossible to forge. Especially by some guy in the 19th century with a cup of artificial cement and some chicken feathers. But although it's already clear that this is total nonsense, I have to say some of the arguments in support of it are pretty entertaining too. They're all based on pretty severe ignorance of geology and fossilization, and oh hey, I'm pretty sure I just heard my entire audience sarcastically gasp with surprise. One argument was that the part of the specimen with feathers has a different texture than the part without. Which is true, and would be immediately understood by any child who's ever pressed their foot into mud and seen how the texture differs. Yeah, obviously that's how it is, what would you expect? Another argument is that the counter slab, the other side of the fossil, from when the rock was split open to reveal the fossil, does not show feather impressions, while the slab does. And again, the explanation is pretty simple to realize, especially when you understand where these specimens were taken from. When an animal sinks to the fairly hard bottom of a lagoon and is subsequently covered up by sediment and then fossilized, the sediment that covered it after the fact retains a much better impression than the already existing lake bed that the animal would have lain on top of, and made a partial impression on. because the sediment forms thoroughly around the top side of the specimen. The feathers would have made a good impression in that sediment, but they wouldn't have made much of an impression at all in the bottom of the lagoon. And this is a pretty typical feature of many fossils from the Solnhofen limestone where this was taken from, so either all of those fossils are questionable as forgeries, or this is a stupid point. Another argument they made was that there were small raised blobs on the slab, which weren't matched by indentations on the counter slab. Obviously there should be nothing on the slab which can interfere with it interlocking with the counter slab, because otherwise they weren't separated from each other, and that's actually been useful in demonstrating some forgeries in the past. But it's just false that those are there. Remember, these guys are looking at shitty pictures to get their evidence, and they look at it, they think it's there, and it's not. They also claim that the entire set of tail feathers was just one feather, pressed into the cement. Which is demonstrably false, since the feathers are clearly defined separately and their individual attachments are visible. There's a few other claims, but you get the gist. These are stupidly ignorant arguments to make when you're going public with the HOT SCOOP that the most famous fossil probably ever is a hoax. But here's the silliest thing of all in my opinion. Now full disclosure, I don't have the original source for this. I tried, but it's not exactly the easiest thing to get copies of the British Journal of Photography from 29 years ago. I contacted the author of the Talk Origins article that contains this quote, and he doesn't have the original article because it was in his university library when he wrote the rebuttal. I recruited my Twitter followers to try to find it, they didn't. I contacted the British Journal of Photography itself, they haven't got back to me. I checked the databases of my local library, they don't have it. So it's possible possible that there's more to this than it appears. So since I don't want to be accused of quote mining, I'll just put an asterisk on this and say I'm not 100% sure about it, but assuming it's an accurate quote, it's pretty damn hilarious, so I think it warrants inclusion. After their 1985 efforts, they got back at it in 1988, because I guess that was something they felt the need to do after their first humiliation, and incredibly, they claimed that the feather impressions had been forged onto a fossil of a flying reptile. Not that they were forged to make it look like a flying reptile, but that the original fossil was a flying reptile, and they faked feathers on top of it. Take a second and let that sink in. What flying reptiles do we know of in the dinosaur age? Well, birds for one. There is no fossil reptile with a skeleton like this and wing membranes or any other flying mechanism in place of feathers. It either doesn't exist or it's never been discovered. Unless they're claiming that the fossil that was used in the forgery was of a revolutionary brand new species of a theropod with wing membranes, which in the 19th century would have been just as impressive as Archaeopteryx, then the only possibility for a flying reptile that this was faked on top of is a feathered flying Archaeopteryx. But that's definitely not what they thought this was, since if that's what this was, well then this actually is a fossil of a feathered Archaeopteryx, whether the feathers are fake or not, and they don't think it's that. So what's our other option? There's only one. Pterosaurs. Yep, based on their own wording, I can't see any other way to explain this statement but that they thought the skeleton was a fucking pterosaur. Hey, you remember this picture? Yeah. Oh, little Kenty, I think I figured out where you got your paleontological education from. Now, to be fair, in 1986, Hoyle and his astronomer buddy said they thought the fossil was of a Compsognathus, which actually makes sense. I mean, Archaeopteryx has been misidentified as Compsognathus in the past. But that didn't stop them from signing their names onto this thing in 1988, no, did it? Because why bother staying in the realm of sanity, right? You're already a laughingstock. If you're gonna get freaky, get freaky. No can't. Archaeopteryx was not proven to be a fraud in 1986. The only thing that was proven was that the authors were complete idiots on this subject. Archaeopteryx means ancient wing. They're gonna say, see boys and girls, he's got claws on his wings. Yeah, so? So it's half leg and half wing, despite you saying that wouldn't work. 
Anyway, let me see if I understand here. It's a fossil bird with a full set of teeth, unlike any modern bird species, with a long bony tail, unlike all modern birds, lacking a reverse toe, unlike any modern bird species, with half leg, half wings, dozens of other similarities to dinosaurs, and a nice smooth line of progressively less bird-like and progressively more dinosaurian transitional fossils linking it back to dinosaurs. But it's absurd to even consider that it might be related to dinosaurs, because... Well, because Kent Hovind can't twist the literal words of the Bible far enough to allow himself to believe it. That's really all there is to this. But I'm a little confused about something here, Kent. See, I thought you said it was proven to be a hoax. So why did you immediately start talking about its specific anatomical features instead of talking about why it's a hoax? If you really think it was proven to be a hoax, wouldn't it be far more damning to provide us with a citation saying it's a hoax? Maybe explain some of the evidence that proves it's a hoax? You know, instead of skipping all of that and immediately jumping into why you think its anatomy doesn't prove anything. There wouldn't be much need to criticize the interpretation of the anatomy of a hoax if you convinced your audience it's a hoax. You could always discuss why its anatomy wouldn't work even if it wasn't a hoax if you really want to wrap things up for the people who aren't convinced, but the fact that you touched on it being a hoax for about one second, and then immediately started talking about its anatomy as if it's real, makes me think there's one of two things happening in your head. Number one, you don't really think you can prove it's a hoax, so you probably shouldn't have said it in the first place. Or number two, there are just way too many transitional fossils these days for you to feel comfortable dismissing all of them based on a dismissal of just one of them as a hoax. Twelve birds today have claws on their wings. The ostrich does, the Watson does, Taraco does, Ibis does. So what? It's kind of unusual, but twelve birds have it. Okay, you've decided this is definitely a bird. Or a hoax. Or a bird hoax. I'm a little confused which, but anyway, you've just admitted there are 12 kinds of birds living today with half leg, half wings that work just fine. And yet you still pretend you don't understand how a half leg, half wing can be of any use at all? Will you please stop attacking your own arguments? I'm supposed to be doing that. Now, I've already explained to you some of the features Archaeopteryx doesn't share with modern birds, but does share with dinosaurs. The link between Archaeopteryx and both dinosaurs and birds is based on its whole anatomy, not just the claws and the wings. But the fact that a few birds still have claws on their wings is very helpful in confirming the link between Archaeopteryx and modern birds, not to mention modern birds and dinosaurs. So that really helps to bolster the evolutionary interpretation, and thank you very much for mentioning it. But let's talk about bird claws. Now let's say you and I go toe-to-toe -to -toe on bird claw and see who comes out the victor. So, this is Archaeopteryx's hand. Oops, no, sorry, that's, that's a dinosaur. No, this is Archaeopteryx's hand. Mmm, no, no, that's... hold on. There, this is... actually, no, sorry. I think I got my slides mixed up here. How about this one? Nope. Maybe this one? Huh. How about this one? Nope. Nope. Wait, go back? One more. One more. Oh, uh, this one actually is Archaeopteryx, sorry. They just look so alike it gets confusing sometimes. Especially because a couple of those dinosaur fossils clearly show feathers. Makes it really hard to tell them apart. Actually, go forward again? Oh, that's an Archaeopteryx too. Shit, I really got confused there, didn't I? But can you blame me? And now let's look at one of the modern birds you mentioned that has claws. This is an ostrich hand. Yep, definitely an ostrich hand. Actually, on second glance, uh, no, that's another Archaeopteryx, sorry. Excuse my mistake, please. The difference is just so subtle I can barely tell them apart. No, this is an ostrich hand. You can see the little claw on the tip of the finger there. The similarities are shocking, really. Clearly, Archaeopteryx's wing bones had far more in common with modern clawed birds than with dinosaurs. Please, God, let him believe it. Oh, but I hear you saying, you gotta look at the what scene! That's the best example there is! Well, we kinda already did, but here you go. The best I got here is a diagram, but it'll do. When they're younger, they have claws on two digits, like you saw in the video. Not all three like Archaeopteryx, but still, remarkably more dinosaur-like than other modern birds. And of course, as they get older, they lose those claws. So what's my point with all this? Well, it's that although you can just laugh off the concept of Archaeopteryx having ancient wings by appealing to the fact that modern birds have claws, it becomes a lot less easy when you actually look at the anatomy of the entire hand. The vast majority of modern birds have the typical clubby, merged-together wing bones, and while a number of them retain one or even two claws into adulthood, that doesn't change the fact that the hands of all modern birds are very different from those of Archaeopteryx, while the hands of Archaeopteryx are barely distinguishable from those of other small theropods. Now, you yourself call Archaeopteryx nothing more than a bird, despite every aspect of its anatomy being clearly dinosaurian, including, might I add, its feathers. They're gonna say, well, he's got teeth in his beak. That proves he's got a reptilian feature. Well, now, wait a minute. Some reptiles have teeth, some don't. Some mammals have teeth, some don't. Some fish have teeth, some don't. Some of you have teeth, some don't. Okay? 
That doesn't prove a thing, all right? Now you hold on just one second. Wasn't that the same joke chemist, scientist, auto technician John Morris Pendleton used in Hello, I'm a Scientist, episode 11? As far as having teeth in their mouth, there are reptiles that have teeth. There are reptiles that don't have teeth. There are birds that don't have teeth, and there are some birds that do have teeth. I mean, even some of you. There's some of you that have teeth, some of you don't have teeth. I knew it! Damn it, John! You couldn't even come up with your terrible, unfunny jokes by yourself? Okay, I'll give you one thing, Kent. Your delivery was a whole lot better. But look, man, it gets a little bit old when you ignore corroborating pieces of evidence and pretend that each individual part of every whole exists in a vacuum. You do it a lot. Like, you think it helps your point when, in reality, it just makes you look incredibly dumb. I mean, look, imagine one day you're walking down the road, right? You see a dog, and at first it bares its teeth at you and barks, but then it runs over and you pet it, and you say, wow, this is such an affectionate bird. Why didn't you fly away, little bird? Weren't you scared? And your friend says to you, what the hell are you talking about? That is a dog. And you say, no, it isn't. Look at it. And your friend's like, what? You look at it. It's walking on four legs. It's got fur, floppy ears. It's got a wet nose and it barks. It's got teeth. And you say, hey, don't jump to conclusions, man. That's not scientific. Some birds have teeth and some don't. Do you think anyone would consider you an intelligent human being if you did that, Kent? Oh, for fuck's sake, of course they would. I'm pretty sure your audience actually would start believing dogs are birds if that's what you told them. If the only difference between Archaeopteryx and modern birds was that it has teeth, Kent, we wouldn't be having this conversation right now, and you fucking well know it. Alan Fiducia is considered one of the world's experts on birds. He believes in evolution. University of Chapel Hill, North Carolina, Chapel Hill. He said, paleontologists have tried to turn Archaeopteryx into an earthbound feathered dinosaur, but it's not. It's a bird, a perching bird, and no amount of paleo babble is going to change that. Hmm, well, depending on how the classification beat-em-up has been going, it may well have been a bird, I don't really care what they call it, but I'm not so sure about the perching part. Archaeopteryx appears to have lacked a reverse toe, which would limit its perching ability, but that's not such a bad oversight, especially because the specimen that showed that was found in 2005, a few years after your speech, so that's okay. What Fiducia seems to be whining about there is that people are saying it's not capable of powered flight, which is an argument I don't really care to get invested in. It's got nothing to do with what we're talking about. But Fiducia's a bit of an oddball because he proposed that rather than being theropod themselves, birds share a common ancestor with theropods. The majority of paleontologists disagree with him, and of course, despite your characterization of him as one of the world's experts on birds, he's not the king of the bird studiers. He can't just hand down dictates about reality from on high, and his outsider opinion won't modify general consensus unless he can back up his opinions with appropriately compelling evidence. It's weird though that you take his word as a bird expert as gospel when he says this thing that you think shows his agreement with you, but then you conveniently ignore his surely equal expert opinion that birds evolved from a common ancestor with theropod dinosaurs. Which is it? Is he an expert whose word we should take at face value or not? But fiducia aside, there's plenty of debate over whether Archaeopteryx should be classified as a bird or a dinosaur. When you have such remarkable intermediate specimens as those, you're gonna get people arguing, sometimes harshly. And that just goes to show how useful the genus is to demonstrate the link between dinosaurs and birds. Paleontologists can classify Archaeopteryx as a dinosaur or a bird based on objective analysis since they have no ideological commitment to any particular assignment. God's not gonna hate them if they call it a bird. Satan's not gonna drag them to hell if they call it a dinosaur. If there were no disagreement, I would be amazed. The fossils straddle the line between dinosaur and bird too well. But despite that, paleontologists want to classify them as one or the other instead of just sitting on the fence until the end of time. And they love to argue about classification. This is business as usual for them. But creationists, though, have a problem. Most of you seem to have come down on the bird side, which personally I think is a terrible tactical move. These days it poses a serious problem, because now you're stuck in a position where if any of you were to try to reassign Archaeopteryx from bird kind to dinosaur kind, based on the facts that it has the skeleton of a dinosaur and that dinosaurs clearly had feathers, you'd reinforce the position of your opponents by showing that the fossils are so clearly intermediate that even creationists can't agree amongst each other on whether they belong to birds or dinosaurs. It's a bird! I'm gonna remember you said that, Kent, just in case you ever change your mind. But fine, I accept your classification. I don't care whether it's classified as a dinosaur, or a bird, or both, or neither. It changes nothing. Whatever you want to call it, it's still the same fossil it always was. And so it, like all other feathered dinosaurs, bird-like dinosaurs, early birds, is still a gigantic wrench in your creationist gears. By the way, even by their twisted thinking, birds are found in layers lower than Archaeopteryx. Well, yeah, potentially a lot, depending on classification. It's not like Archaeopteryx just popped out of nowhere. What's your point? If you find fully formed birds in rock that you think is 130 million years old, then Archaeopteryx at 65 million years old cannot be a missing link, can it? It can't be a missing link no matter how old it is, because it's not missing.
But nitpicking aside, what you just said was completely false. Can you stop pulling numbers out of your ass, please? Archaeopteryx is more like 150 million years old, not 65. So it makes perfect sense that you'd find 130 million year old birds, because birds like Archaeopteryx were there at least 20 million years before that. Now, let me explain something to you about so-called missing links, or rather, transitional fossils. Even though your numbers are total bullshit, I'm gonna pretend they're not. Let's say there was an Archaeopteryx fossil found that was about 65 million years old, and a Confucius Ornus fossil that was about 130 million. Confucius Ornus is an early bird more similar to modern birds than Archaeopteryx is, by the way. Now, we have these two fossils. The more birdy looking one is older than the more dinosaur looking one, so what does that tell us? Well, the Confucius Ornus would tell us that by 130 million years ago, birds had evolved sufficiently that at least one species was as morphologically similar to modern birds as Confucius Ornus is. Which of course does not imply that no other species retain more of their older, more dinosaur-like features. The Archaeopteryx would tell us that 65 million years ago, at least one bird species still retained its more dinosaur-like features. Would this prove that all Confucius Ornus-like birds lived before all Archaeopteryx-like birds? No. That's like saying the coelacanth can't exist today just because other types of fish evolved long after coelacanth-like fish. It makes no sense. Older features aren't automatically wiped from the ecosystem when newer ones come along. To suggest that they always will be is as asinine as asking why if humans evolved from monkeys, why are there still monkeys? It betrays a total lack of understanding of the concept of evolution or just the basics of how nature works. Now of course, if we found tons of Confucius Ornus fossils from 130 million years ago, but the entire fossil progression from dinosaurs to birds was younger than that, or if Confucius Ornus came much earlier in that progression than it should, that would be extremely odd and we'd have to reconsider some things. And if it was the rule, rather than the exception, for fossil fossils more similar to modern animals to be older than the less similar ones, that would also pose a problem. But that's not the case, either in your totally made up scenario or in reality. So even if your outright lie here were true, Confucius Ornus and Archaeopteryx, with their significant similarities to dinosaurs and to modern birds, are both transitional fossils. Even with their dumb geologic column, it doesn't work. We cover lots more on that on video four. Well, I just explained why it does, even under your completely fictional scenario that you made up, but yeah, I'm not interested in your videotapes, Kent. Especially when I know your argument's just gonna be based on fake-ass numbers, like that Archaeopteryx is 65 million years old. But okay, let's see what's on the screen here. Fossil remains of a bird which lived between 142 and 137 million years ago were recently found in the Liaoning province of northeastern China. The discovery made by- Oh hey! Alan Fiducia! You're a big fan, eh? Provides the oldest evidence of a beaked bird on Earth yet found. Okay, so this is talking about Liaoning Ornus, found in the Yixian Formation, and hopefully I'm not butchering that too bad. At the time Liaoning Ornus was found, the Yixian Formation was still thought to be about 20 million years older than it was later found out to be through radiometric dating, and so it was thought that Liaoning Ornus was almost as old as Archaeopteryx. Of course, since the formation isn't as old as was previously thought, then any discussion of what it might mean if Liaoning Ornus was 140 million years old is pointless because it's not. And yes, it was just as pointless when you gave this speech as it is today, because the study studies that established this were done years before your speech, and while you really should have paid better attention, I promise absolutely nobody expected you to. It goes on to say, the Chinese bird, claim its discoverers, probably lived at the Jurassic Cretaceous boundary, prior to the arrival of Deinonychus and Mononychus, and could not possibly be descended from them. Well, regardless of whether Liaoning Ornus is 140 or 120 million years old, that's true. Both of those dinosaurs are most likely younger than Liaoning Ornus. But of course, nobody's claiming these particular dinosaurs are ancestors of birds. Certainly, they bear striking similarities, Deinonychus in particular, but being similar closely related cousins and being ancestral are two different things. It's not like all Silurosaurian theropods evolved into birds and all non-avian species ceased to exist after that. Non-avian dinosaurs lived on and kept evolving too. So again, everything you're saying here is just an obfuscated version of the old if we come from monkeys, why are there still monkeys chestnut? And it's pretty fucking sad if that's your level of understanding of your opponent's position. They say, bird feathers evolve from scales. Well, that's stupid. Yeah, that's kind of stupid to bring up. After all, if you come along and claim that feathers are exclusively a bird thing and dinosaurs definitely didn't have them, you're gonna immediately get smacked in the face by the fact that so many non-avian dinosaurs had feathers, even including at least some tyrannosauroids. The fact that non-avian dinosaurs had feathers means the evolution of feathers just isn't an issue when we talk about dinosaurs evolving into birds. But since you seem to think feathers are just a bird thing, the question arises, what are you gonna do now? Are you gonna look at a 30-foot-long, totally wingless Eutyrannus and classify it as 
as a bird so you can keep this humdinger of an argument? Or will you end up deciding that the evolution of feathers just isn't that good of an argument against dinosaur-to-bird evolution and proclaim that dinosaurs had feathers too? Or maybe you'll start picking at the differences between the feathers possessed by different dinosaurs and birds? You know. Oh sure, they had filamentous feathers, yeah, of course. But those aren't real feathers. They're just one filament. What kind of feather has just one filament? Well, okay, that one has multiple filaments, but those are plumaceous feathers, not pinaceous feathers. Oh, well, okay, okay, those are pinaceous feathers, but they're not flying feathers. That kind of thing. I think that'd be another really bad tactical move for you, by the way, since it's just gonna keep getting worse and worse as time rolls on. But it's an option. I'm genuinely curious to see where you go from here. But it doesn't matter much either way, though, because there's no serious difficulty explaining the evolution of scales to feathers regardless. I'm happy to talk about this a little bit, but tell me what you think is so stupid about it so I know what to concentrate on. In the first place, they come from different genes on the chromosome, okay? Developed totally different. A scale is a, a hard wrinkle in the skin. They attach to the skin very differently. Feathers are incredibly complex, folks. Unbelievably complicated. They're both made from the same protein, keratin, and that's where the similarity stops. All right, gotcha. Let's go through this piece by piece. In the first place, they come from different genes on the chromosome, okay? Do they now? And where did you get this information? Because I don't think that's something you could have known in 2001. So I'm guessing that, as usual, it came straight out of your asshole. And of course, since that which is asserted without evidence can be dismissed without evidence, I would be more than justified if I chose to ignore you completely. But since I've already been scolded a couple times in this video for that, I'm not even gonna try, so let's talk about it. Reptile and bird scales, and feathers, develop from anatomical placodes. Thickened structures in the skin, which result from the expression of the sonic hedgehog, or SHH, and bone morphogenetic protein 2, or BMP2 genes, in different locations in the skin. The anatomical parts involved, and the genes and proteins involved, in making scales and feathers are the same. The difference between scales and feathers appears to arise from variations in the timing and direction of the expression of these two genes that I mentioned. Now, primitive feathers were just filaments, lacking the various plumes, branches, and barbs of various types of later feathers. And these hollow filaments could have originated simply by a re-expression of SHH and BMP2 after the formation of the placode, so that instead of growing out of a single fold, the scale, for lack of a better word, grows out of an indented ring-shaped zone, and forms a hollow tubular structure. The further changes to the shape of the feather itself would then have required only small changes. Re-expression of those same genes, first in a vertical pattern, creating plumed feathers, and then later shifting to a horizontal pattern, creating branched feathers. And by the way, this is all newer than your speech. Certainly when you were talking, you had no goddamn clue if your assertion about feathers and scales being totally genetically separate was true, even if you'd bothered to put a moment's research into it, which I don't think you did. So the only possibility here is that you were talking shit based on nothing. Which I'm absolutely dismayed to find you doing. I thought you were better than that little Kenty. You've been so honest throughout this entire series so far. Develop totally different. Of course they develop differently. If they didn't develop differently, they'd be identical. The differences in them are because they develop differently. Why would you expect different structures to develop the same way? But the difference is just in different signaling patterns. It's really not that dramatic of a difference, functionally. A scale is a, a hard wrinkle in the skin. Basically, yeah. They attach to the skin very differently. Well, obviously. Nobody's arguing that a feather and a scale are the same structure. We're all aware of what a feather is and what a scale is, Kent. The claim is that genetically, one was the basis for the other, and since they both developed by the same structure, the placode, being reshaped through SHH and BMP2 expression, that's perfectly plausible. Yes, a feather involves at least one extra expression of those genes to achieve its mounting inside the indented color of skin, which is the very different attachment you're talking about, and for sure that looks quite different, but in terms of what's actually needed to make it happen, it's not that different at all. Feathers are incredibly complex, folks. Unbelievably complicated. Modern feathers are complex compared to scales, yeah, although not all feathers are as complex as you're probably thinking. But of course the relative complexity is not in dispute. The point isn't that feathers are as simple as scales, that'd just be stupid. The point is that feathers could have been reached by way of scales, not that they are scales. And they can, especially since, as I mentioned, feathers were originally not as complex as they are now, and because all of the required changes can be achieved through minor variations in how SHH and BMP2 signaling work. They're both made from the same protein, keratin, and that's where the similarity stops. Not just keratin, beta-keratin specifically, which is found only in reptiles and birds. Or maybe I should say in reptiles including birds. And as I've explained, there's plenty more similarity than just that. But you're Kent Hovind. Things that aren't known when you give your speech simply are not and cannot and never will be true. Unless, of course, you find it convenient. So what? Battleships and forks are both made of iron. <laughs> Doesn't prove they both evolved from a tin can. 
A tin can is not made of iron. But again, you see what I mean about you separating off one piece of evidence and pretending it's the only one there is, right? Hey, you have fun with your new toothy, furry, barking bird, Kent. Just be careful it doesn't fly away. Proves the engineer's using the same material for different functions. And God used keratin for fingernails and hair and scales and feathers. So, same designer, that's what it proved. Actually, if the fact that they were both made of keratin was the only evidence, it wouldn't prove a damn thing about a designer or evolution. But fortunately, it's not the only evidence at all, and you're just plain flat out lying again, so fuck you, I guess is all I really need or want to say. Alright, well, that feels like enough for today. I must have gone through at least, like, what, ten minutes of your speech there? Let's have a look. Three minutes? How is that even possible? And there are thirty minutes left? This is never gonna end, is it? I'm just stuck with you forever. Well, I'll see you next time then, Ken. You're a